check today. If there are any that I've missed, please alert me and we can talk about them later or I'll answer them after the class. Okay, so I think my name is showing up properly now because I'm just another uh, panelist with you guys and uh, Danny is Mises Institute. So Danny, uh, can you hear me? Are we good to go? Okay, I uploaded the slide myself. That worked okay. Okay, uh, good evening everybody. Glad to be back and um, let's resume with the talk. And we're going to pick up where we left off. If I can find, here we go. Okay, so this week um, I'm going to do something I did last class, which, which worked out pretty good. Um, I mean, I have this blog at, you'll, at C4SIF. Let me see if I can turn on the laser pointer, actually. I had trouble last time. No, it's not going to let me do it. Oh, never mind. Um, I have a blog or a site called C4SIF.org, and I, I, I post regularly um, various IP-related items. Um, there's probably one about every um, – maybe two or three a day. There's so many things to blog about. So that's a good way to keep up with what's going on. And so in the beginning of each class, sometimes I have like an out outrages of the week, and I just kind of go through quickly some of the things I posted in the last week or two of the course actually. Um, it's hard to keep up because there's so many things going on. Um, so anyway, like I said, it's at c4sif.org, which is a think tank I started, or really just kind of a private uh, research foundation I started last year. It means uh, Center for the Study of Innovative Freedoms, but basically it's about getting rid of IP law, so we have innovative freedoms. Um, the New Grave Robbers, I'll just go through a few of these right here. The New Grave Robbers is about um, – let's see if I can turn on this laser pointer somehow. Yeah, it's not letting me do it. Um, not sure where it is on here. Anyway, um, so the new grave robbers is about a type of IP rock called the right of publicity, which is it's called grave robbers because it's lasting past um, the death of the the famous person um, in some American states, and it's being used more and more. Uh, it's called a right of publicity or an identity right. And one recent case is the Tolkien estate is trying to block a novel that uses Tolkien as a character. So this could threaten historical fiction. So this is an example of how um, one type of IP law can actually restrict free speech and free expression. Uh, here's a blog post about recent IP cartel advances. This was – a lot of these are reposts of other people's blogs, but this is about how in Europe there's a steam uh, – um, for um, uh, motion or uh, uh, I guess uh, um, uh, agitation for changing the law and adding new IP rights and strengthening IP law, even in Sweden um, um, and in Italy and in France. Uh, so you can browse that later. We have a lot to go through, so I'm just going to go through some of these quickly. You can read these blogs. These are all linked, by the way, on the slides. Um, uh, owning language. Uh, using trademark law, a lot of companies are fighting over the use of words. This has always been done, but it seems to be an increasing problem. Right now we have Apple actually claiming the right to the term App Store, which is ridiculous But uh, because uh, Amazon actually has the Amazon App Store up now, and so Apple is uh, – and Amazon may be in litigation. Um, <clears throat> there's a new white paper up, and it's kind of funny. It's called – it will be awesome if they don't screw it up. 3D printing, intellectual property, and the fight over the great, the next great disruptive technology. Uh, 3D printing is going to be, some people think, an amazing new thing where you can basically have, you, you can have um, uh, manufacture three-dimensional objects using a recipe. And so, of course, if you have intellectual property that interferes with this, you could stop people from making things. In their own houses, like making screws or shapes or widgets or gadgets. Okay. Uh, I found an, a quote from uh, 1986, which I liked. Uh, a, an economist named George Priest in a uh, law journal. Um, in the current state of knowledge, economists know um, almost nothing about the effect on social welfare of the patent system or, or of other systems of intellectual property. So we have this system where 
even today, we still the economists have still didn't yet not been able to verify the claims um, of empiricists or the advocates of the property uh, IP system. And we'll get to that later in today's course or maybe next course in detail. Uh, there's a new um, patent reform act. There's been one pending for the last five or ten years, but finally it looks like it's, it's gaining steam and maybe about to pass. The, the Senate passed it like 95 to 5. By the way, Rand Paul did vote for it, which is disappointing. But anyway, so there's a new patent reform act called the America Invent Act, and I, I did a blog post just going through the provisions showing how they're not a big deal or they're negative. Um, J. Neil Shulman, an old friend of mine who's a science fiction author and a kind of quasi-Randian and a huge advocate of his strange version of intellectual property called logo rights, um, he's starting to get a, a, a testy about all the challenge to IP by libertarians. And he recently called me the foremost enemy of property rights. Um, I guess I took that as a, um, uh, as a compliment. Jock says, did Sanders. Jock, are you talking to me? I'm not sure what that question is about. Did Sanders. I don't know what that means. Um, there's a recent lawsuit by the RI, the recording industry. Oh, I don't know. It was 95 to 5. I didn't look for – see where, how everyone voted. Uh, Jock says, did Bernie Sanders from Vermont vote for that um, law? I don't know. It's a good question. I in, in my post, I tried to have a link to um, – I tried to have a link to the um, um, to the Edgar site that shows the status of the, the vote. So just check on that, click on that link there that I have there, and maybe maybe you can find out. It was 95 to 5, so only a few people held out. I saw the people who voted didn't vote for it. And I don't remember seeing his name. It's like three Democrats, two Republicans, if I recall. Um, but there was a suit where the RIAAA is suing the LimeWire. For file sharing, and they've done the math using the, the statutory damages in the copyright statute, and they've added it up, multiplying it by all the different sharings of these files, like, I don't know, 10,000 files being shared many times. And they've calculated that they're owed $75 trillion of damages from LimeWire. This is not a joke, $75 trillion. Um, I have a, a blog post about an old patent in 1924 where they're warning people you cannot use your airplane to write. Words in the sky because you violate our patent. That's kind of funny. Um, I also have a trademark about, um, I mean, a post about trademark absurdities with two cases here in Houston. That's me in front of this pub called the Velvet Melvin, which used to be called the Velvet Elvis um, because they had the a painting of that Velvet Elvis painting on the inside or the print or whatever on the inside of the pub. And that was their name. And then the Elvis Presley estate sued them and um, Shut them down actually, so they finally reopened and renamed themselves the Velvet Melvin, which is ridiculous, but they had to do that. And then there's the famous Taco Cabana and Two Pesos suit, which I discussed briefly in that post. Um, here's one. Um, uh, there's an Asian American uh, band up in Portland called the Slants, and they applied for a trademark, and the trademark office denied it on the grounds that the trademark. Or the name of their band is racist. So these are Asian Americans, and they call themselves the Slants um, for obvious reasons. But you know, anyway, I have a sign down here, Fat Ho Burgers. That's actually from a uh, from a blog post about this actual burger chain called Fat Ho Burgers. So I guess they would have trouble too. <coughs> One more thing, Howard Hughes, the famous uh, eccentric billionaire, actually filed a uh, he purchased a bunch of companies uh, on, and uh, copyrights under the name of some other companies that he owned, Copy and, and he purchased copyrights to articles written about him that were used for this uh, unauthorized biography. And then he sued the, 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 the publisher of the biography for copyright infringement. So he was using copyright to stop people from commenting about him. Um, I'll skip this one for now to, to, to try to save a little time. So where we left off, we, we were talking about the types of IP, um, patent, copyright, trademark, trade secret, and other types of IP, and what the focus of the course is going to be. And today's lecture will be on – we'll continue talking about law. I'll elaborate some more things about law, and then we're going to go into the history of the uh, patent and the copyright system. Okay. So. I, I didn't mention last time um, 
let me explain one thing. So I've, I've mentioned several types of IP, patent, copyright, trademark, trade secret, um, uh, boat hull designs, uh, network protection, publicity rights, reputation rights, um, moral rights, but we're going to focus in this course on patent and copyright. These are the two big ones that cause the most problem. These are the two um, that are, are the most uh, dangerous. Uh, now, it's hard to say which one's worse. I'm a patent attorney. I've done copyright as well. Um, it's hard to say which one's worse. I tend to think patent is worse in some ways, but then patents only last 17 or so years. Um, now, there are, as I mentioned, there are reputation rights and related rights like publicity and media rights and identity rights, which we just talked about, which are also unlibertarian in my view, which I'll discuss why later. Um, many aspects of trademark law are unlibertarian in my view. Um, let me just give a quick overview of the problem of trademark law. The only good thing about trademark law could be done by just pure fraud law, and that is if one company defrauds a customer by misrepresenting the goods he's selling to them. So let's say I, I sell you a, a fake Rolex watch for $10,000, and I represent it as a genuine Rolex. Um, I've defrauded you, and you can sue me. Under the current law, Rolex can sue me for trademark infringement. They're the plaintiff, not the defrauded customer, which makes no sense. Um, but in the real case, a Rolex watch is sold for $20, and it's a fake Rolex, and the customer knows it, and he's not defrauded. And yet Rolex can still sue the seller even though there's no fraud. So that's the other problem with the trademark law. Um, there are also unlibertarian aspects of trade secret law, um, which we'll get to later. But the main focus will be on patent and copyright because once you understand the problems with these, then it's easy to figure out how to view the sort of more junior type of IP rights. Oh, by the way, I, I mentioned earlier Edgar. I, I was thinking wrong. Edgar is the online database for securities filings, SEC filings with the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. What I meant was Thomas. If you search T-H-O-M-A-S, which stands for Thomas Jefferson, Thomas is the big database for um, congressional uh, bills and votes and things like this. So that's where you can check and find out who voted for um, that um, American Invents Act and find out whether Bernie Sanders from Vermont voted for it. <laughs> okay, so let's continue with patent rights. Uh, and by the way, I just want to mention something. Okay, Jock is posting here who voted against it, I guess. Yeah, Sanders is not there, so I suppose Sanders voted for it, which is… Bad. Now, some people think that the the Reform Act improves a little bit. Um, if you look at my summary of the provisions, I don't think it's an improve. Anything that's improved is minor, and there are some negative uh, parts to it. In any case, let's move on. Um, I call it in intellectual property. That's the American terminology, or IP. is typically called industrial property outside of the U.S., um, although there really is no such thing as intellectual property as a type of right. That is sort of a descriptive term we use to cover many types of rights, patents, copyright, trademarks, trade secrets, etc. cetera. Um, now, on patents, it's important to remember what I think I emphasized it last time, and if anyone has any questions about this, please ask me because it's important to understand this. Just to understand how patents work, a patent is not the right to practice your claimed invention. It's only the right to stop other people from practicing it. Because it's possible that by your practicing your invention, you would violate someone else's patent. Patents can overlap. Okay, So to get a patent, it needs to be new on the basis of the prior art. Okay, It doesn't have to uh, not infringe someone else's patent. It could infringe a patent, and the, the, the chair example I gave last time is, is an example of that. Someone invents a, a stool, and they have a patent on a… A stool, which is like a seat with some legs attached to it, and then someone else comes up with a chair, which is a stool with a seat attached to the back of the of the I'm sorry with a, with a back attached to the seat, and um, the you could get a patent on the chair because it would be novel and non-obvious possibly, but you could not um, you couldn't use it because it would still be a stool because it would still have a seat and um, legs, so it's a type of stool. 
So that's the example. That's the difference. So there are two types of sort of publications or things that matter for uh, a patent. Uh, one is publications, like any article or any knowledge that's publicized in a, in a way, like a magazine article can be what's called prior art. Or a patent application itself, even if it's expired, like even a 50-year-old patent application published in the in the patent office, uh, you know, uh, records, it could, could serve as prior art, and you wouldn't be able to get a new patent if it, if it's already described in one of those. If the examiner at the patent office finds it, that is. But when you infringe a patent, it has to be a live existing patent, one that has not expired. Now, for patents, let's talk about remedies. When you have a patent and someone makes, uses, sells, or, or exports uh, – I'm sorry, imports a, um, um, a, a device or uses a method that is covered by the claims of your patent, then one of the remedies you can get is you can go to court and you can ask the court – well, you can sue for money, okay, money damages. But you can also ask the court to grant an injunction, which is an order by the court telling the infringer you must stop doing this. Okay. Now, if you think about it, a patent is a, a monopoly license granted to an applicant by the government. Okay. So the government claims the right to break that grant if they want to. That's called a compulsory license. So the government claims the right if they want to to issue to someone else a license to make your patent, and then they'll pay you reasonable damages like as compensation. So you treat it like a property right even though they have the right you – know, they don't have to grant you patent rights. So – in fact, they threatened to do this in the anthrax Cipro case about 10 years ago. If you remember, there was an anthrax scare here in the U.S., and there's only one maker who was making um, the Cipro drug, and they couldn't make enough. They were charging a lot for it. Okay. Um, and uh, Congress or the Patent Office, whoever is in charge of that, I'm not a Commerce Department, I guess, threatened to uh, issue a compulsory license to uh, authorize other people to make this drug, but they didn't have to because the maker of Cipro lowered the price and made more. Okay. And the funny thing is, sometimes you'll have advocates of IP. They will, you know, bristle with outrage if, if you talk about the government issuing a compulsory license. But all that means is the government is kind of taking back a, a monopoly privilege grant that they gave the patentee in the first place. Um, it's kind of funny to get outraged about the government taking back a monopoly grant that they gave someone. It'd be like if they authorized someone in a town, you're the only guy who can make shoes, and then the government one day says, "Ah, oh, we're going to take away that. We're going to we're going to stop enforcing that and let other people make shoes." and Someone would accuse the government of infringing this guy's property rights to be the only one to make shoes in a given town. That's what it's about. Um, by the way, some libertarians actually – or some people actually call for um, either supplementing the patent system or replacing it with a, a prize system or a bonus system. So instead of granting people these monopoly rights and letting them use it to extort um, higher prices out of customers or – extort damages out of the competition or to reduce competition with a threat of a lawsuit, um, what they say is instead of doing that, you ought to like have the government steal money from taxpayers, put it in a big tr a big fund, uh, like some have said, like $80 billion. Take $80 billion from the taxpayers, put it in a uh, – and use that every year with a, uh, to be handed out to people that come up with um, worthwhile inventions. Like in the medical industry, something like that. It'd be sort of like a private Nobel, I mean, like a government Nobel Prize or a government MacArthur Prize. Uh, we kind of have that already with medical, I mean, with uh, government funding of R&D, right? The government takes money and funds it on R&D and military contractors all the time already. Uh, big science is already heavily corrupted by a similar idea. But this idea is you you appoint a panel of government chosen experts who would decide who's going to get. Um, I give you a million dollars. I give you half a million dollars. I give you ten thousand dollars. I give you ten million dollars, here and there. I mean, this is advocated as far back as 1787, maybe earlier, as far as I know. But the, uh, James Madison in the U.S. advocated 1787. Michael Pollyani 
Um, Polanyi advocated 1944. This was actually done in Russia in 1834 and the Soviet Union in 1941. So you can see it's a really free market idea to do this, right? Uh, it has been advocated by Joseph Stiglitz, who is an alleged quasi-free market economist and Nobel Prize winner, I believe. Uh, Bernie Sanders, the socialist from Vermont that Josh just mentioned. Uh, and the libertarian quasi-Austrian Alexander Tabarrok. Um, anyway, let's skip on. Let's skip down to the next uh, slide now. Um, there is something in patent law, and there's actually something similar in copyright law. It's called the exhaustion uh, doctrine. Um, the, I, I have this in here because in my last class in, in, in November of last year, um, a student asked this question, and I thought it fit in nicely here. They asked about what the exhaustion doctrine was about. The idea here is that um, if you sell a patented item, then you're giving an implicit license to the buyer to use it. In other words, you can't sell a new mousetrap that you have patented to someone and then sue that person for violating your patent. You've basically given them permission to use your, your patent by selling them the, the device. Now then if he resells it to a second customer down the line, you can't sue him either because the idea is that you've exhausted your right to exploit your monopoly um, already. Now I won't go into the details of this, but you can read this later if you'd like, this quanta versus the LG, LG Electronics case. It was an Intel sort of dispute that involved uh, um, intricacies of this exhaustion doctrine. There's a similar idea in copyright, by the way. I don't think I have this in any of my slides, so let me mention here. Um, I have a, a blog post up. If you search on my C4SAF.org blog for the Omega, O-M-E-G-A-A, I'm sorry, O-M-E-G-A uh, case, it's about the exhaustion doctrine too. I think it's called leveraging IP, leveraging IP. So in copyright, there's a similar doctrine, right? And uh, what happened was there was uh, – Omega was selling their watches, which are apparently very expensive. They sell them uh, at a higher price in the U.S. than in uh, some other countries. So you had these, uh, these guys. They went down to, I don't know, Argentina or Brazil or somewhere, and they would buy the watches legitimately, legally, down in Argentina, and – for a lower price and then sell them back in the U.S. for a higher price. Jockey found it. Thank you. It's a Mises blog post. It's also a for SAF, but thank you for finding that. Um, and Omega doesn't like this because they like to control the prices in their markets, which is their right. Um, but um, they couldn't stop it because they couldn't say it was any kind of violation of any kind of IP right because it was a legitimate watch. There was no fraud being alleged. There was no trademark violation. So what Amiga did was they designed this special little globe logo or something that uh, it's copyrightable. So basically they, they designed an, uh, an original mark, and they put it on the front of the watch or the back of the watch or something, which is, becomes part of the design of the watch. And so now there's a copyright on there. So then they sued this guy for copyright infringement. Well, you would think that the, the exhaustion doctrine would apply to that, but, but in, a, in a sort of intricacy of the copyright law… The court ruled that um, – well, it's called the first sale doctrine in, copy, in copyright law, the first sale doctrine. That means that whoever you sell it to first, um, then they can resell it, and they're not guilty of copyright infringement. This is why libraries can reloan books, uh, and this is why there's a used book market, and it's not called a copyright infringement when you, when you sell that book. Um, <clears throat> but the court said that the first sale has to occur in the U.S. for that to be triggered. So it's ridiculous, but – and anyway, and the, and the danger of this ruling is that um, some libraries now are wondering if some of the books they have on their shelves that they purchased from another country um, are now not covered by the first sale doctrine anymore. So maybe they can't resell them or even loan these books out. Uh, maybe they're infringing copyright as libraries. I don't know what the news has developed about that. Um, uh, another uh, sort of a tw twist on this idea in the patent area is this idea. Um, you guys may have heard of the reimportation uh, issue. That is um, um, uh, so drugs or pharmaceuticals are sold in the U.S. for a high markup if they're patented. Let's say they're very expensive. Now, uh, so Bayer or some company might sell it in the U.S. for a thousand dollars and. They might sell it in Canada for $300 because the Canadian government imposes price controls because they're more – they're not quite as free market in some ways, right? Um, and then so you'll have the drug be reimported back to the U.S. 
because it's the same drug that's sold here, and it's there's no patent infringement because of the exhaustion doctrine. And this 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 first sale idea of copyright law doesn't apply here. So it actually is not a patent infringement. But now you have the FDA problem. So in other words, the FDA says, well, we haven't approved that one, although it's the same drug. We've only approved the one sold in the U.S. So so you have all these av patent advocates saying the FDA should crack down on, on this reimportation of drugs. And so Congress was poised to pass this Drug Reimportation Act, and there was controversy about that. But a lot of the free market advocates who are in favor of patents, like some people at Cato, like if I recall Richard Epstein and a few other people over there, actually were opposed to the right to import a drug from, let's say, Canada that, that had been sold over there to reimport it back to the U.S. because that would undermine the patentee's right to charge a higher price here. So basically you have the advocacy of patent rights of free market guys corrupting their um, – um, their free market principles, and I have some posts on this. I think they are on the Lou Rockwell site, and if you search for Cato Tugs Stray back onto the reservation, if I recall, I think you will find that too. Uh, I don't think this has anything to do with trips, Jock. It was just uh, lobbying in the U.S. Jock asked whether this was related to the trips, T-R-I-P-S in all caps agreement. This is the trade-related aspects of intellectual property. Uh, no, this is just uh, lobbying to change the law or to force the FDA to to go ahead and permit drugs to be reimported if it was the same drug by the same manufacturer that was already approved over here. Go ahead and let it in, and then you had patent advocates fighting against it in the name of patent rights, and they're saying, well, the fact that Canada has a socialist economy and they're having price controls shouldn't penalize you know, bare drugs or whatever over here in the U.S., uh, but you know, Bayer sold this voluntarily over there. They're selling it presumably for a profit, and if the buyer wants to resell it to the U.S., I, it's hard to see how that violates their property rights. Okay, that's an interesting topic, but we spent a lot of time on it. Let's move on. Uh, okay, like I mentioned, the first sale doctrine is the analog of the exhaustion doctrine in copyright law. Um, I've already talked about this, so I will skip slide um, 14. Oh, I do have the Omega. I already have the Omega keys here. <laughs> I got you guys searching for things I already have on here. I forgot what I had on here, um, uh, and so I had the numbers wrong. So Costco bought the Omega Seamaster watch. So it was Costco actually, you know, the big retailer here in the U.S., like they're a Walmart type store or a uh, Sam's Club type store. So it sold for thirteen hundred instead of two thousand in, in in Paraguay. So it's seven hundred dollars cheaper. So they bought it there and they resold it here. So they put a globe on it. So anyway, I've already described this case. So it's an interesting case. Uh, and here, and on this page here on slide 16, I, I have a, a quote from the Wall Street Journal um, talking about how this this decision could affect public libraries um, because of this first sale doctrine idea. Um, I'm going to skip some of this stuff on the top here of slide 17. It's a little bit um, um, arcane stuff about how the actual quanta case worked out, so th don't worry about that too much. It was just one application of the exhaustion doctrine. But I think you can see from this that these monopoly privileges, copyright and patent, granted by the state, uh, you can see how they lead to infringement on property and contract rights. And by the way, one other interesting point. Remember how I, I, I said that uh, Omega, in order – to stop uh, arbitrage, price arbitrage, right? In order to stop um, Costco from buying one of their watches in Paraguay and reselling it in the U.S., um, in order to stop that, which they couldn't do legally otherwise, they put a design on their watch, which they probably otherwise wouldn't have done, just so they could take advantage of copyright law and sort of hook into copyright law. Now, forget about the ethic, ethics of this. Of their action, I mean, they're exploiting state um, IP laws to uh, control their price, basically. And, but the point is, they actually changed their design in response to IP law. So you can see how IP law, in this case, is distorting and maybe corrupting, you might say, 
culture, right, and fashion. And you can also see this in the case of um, the fashion industry, like um, um, you know, Gucci or Louis Vuitton or um, Chanel purses and shoes and dresses and jewelry. They have their logos plastered all over these like purses and things. Now we're used to this now, but why why do they do that? They do that because there is no copyright in fashion. So you could knock off a Louis Vuitton purse. You could knock off a Chanel dress. Maybe I'm using the wrong uh, fashion names, but I'm not into high fashion. But uh, you could knock it off. And in fact, this is done all the time. So what these guys do is they start embedding their trademarks into their products right as part of the design so that now they can accuse a knockoff artist of trademark infringement. Now, if trademark law also wasn't available in the same way that it's available now, then you could see that they, they may never have integrated their their trademark or their logo into their fashion design. That's sort of a weird thing. It's like um, Costco – I'm sorry. It's like um, uh, uh, Omega adding the, uh, the globe design to their watch, not for aesthetic reasons, but just to use copyright law to sue people so they can control their price. So we have a whole distortion of the culture industry just because of the existence of IP law. Now, in addition to um, patent and copyright and trademark and trade secret, there's a type of uh, law um, centered around a cause of action for defamation, um, and you can think of this as reputation rights. Now, this is not traditionally called… Uh, intellectual property, but I think it should be included as IP because it's uh, based upon the same kind of mentality that you are entitled to have a property right in um, some sort of immaterial or intangible thing that has value that you created by your efforts, um, even though it's not an actual material or scarce resource that you own. Um, in fact, it's just what other people think about you. So it's kind of strange that you have a right to what other people are going to think about you. Um, now, defamation, there are two types of defamation. One is called libel. One is called slander. So defamation, libel, and slander, these terms are used sort of interchangeably and sometimes uh, improperly by people. To keep them straight, think of libel as written because they both have an I in them. That's, how, that's the little device I use. Libel and written both have an I. Slander is oral, so it's when you say something bad about someone that is untrue and that hurts their reputation, and when you communicate it or publicize it, it's called. Um, by the way, the word oral is also misused by people, by laymen and even by lawyers. They'll say a, a, a written agreement or um, is that an oral – they'll say is that a, a verbal agreement or a written agreement? Well, all agreements are verbal. Well, actually some are not, like if I silently hand you a dollar for a candy bar, that's… Not verbal at all. Verbal just means words, like verbs. Think the word verb. Um, so whether you write it or speak it, it's still verbal. So even a written agreement is verbal. Um, people use the word verbal as a synonym for oral. Uh, it's just a little um, thing of mine that I'm nitpicky about these things, and uh, people misuse words, and it bugs me. So just letting you guys know. Um, be careful. Use the word oral if you mean um, uh, spoken. Agreement, like say oral agreement, written agreement. Don't say verbal agreement. <clears throat> anyway, it's a state uh, a defamation. It's some kind of statement published to someone else or made to someone else um, that damages someone's reputation. Um, uh, there are some details about defamation law. Number one, it has to be it has to be false. If it's so, truth is usually a defense, at least in the U.S. Um, there's a distinction between fact and opinion. If you just say, in my opinion, that movie was bad, you know, you can't be sued for defamation usually. Um, but if you say, um, you know, the director of that movie took a bribe to make it or something like that, you might be sued. Now, of course, the state usually exempts their own people, judges and prosecutors and legislators and uh, presidents. When they make statements officially from the floor of their office or whatever… Uh, it's called parliamentary privilege or other, other terms you use for it. So, of course, the government makes these laws and then exempts themselves from them. Um, now, a public figure, uh, you need to show actual malice. 
uh, there's like a higher standard, at least in the U.S. And there's a famous, I think, New York Times v. Sullivan case. New York Times v. Sullivan, if any of you are interested, uh, which established that back in the 70s or 60s, I want to say. Um, so um, if you if you say something about Madonna or um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, someone really famous, it's hard for them to sue you for defamation because you have to show that the statement was malicious. In other words, people that are public figures, they're sort of open game for criticism. Um, now, there are other <clears throat> other types of things. Uh, there's um, put, saying something that uh, puts someone in a false light is, is related to rep – similar, similar to reputation rights. Uh, there's invasion of privacy. That's re publicly revealing a private fact. Of course, there's blackmail, which libertarians um, don't think should be uh, a crime. And there's this publicity right, which I mentioned earlier. So you have a variety of types of legal rights that are related to either reputation rights or otherwise the IP. Uh, now, there's also domain name issues. Um, this was established, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. There's a domain name dispute resolution procedure, and basically if someone registers a domain – so let's say you register the name TomCruise.com. Tom Cruise may be able to… Use this UDRP um, procedure to get the um, domain from you, even if you're not infringed. It's, 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 so it's like it's considered to be a sort of tech version of trademark infringement, even though it's not technically uh, counted as trademark infringement. Um, so there's elements here under the policy. This is, I think, an international policy, by the way. I think there's different countries you can sue in. I think Czech Republic is one, and um, actually, I think they're done online. But there are different centers for this. But the domain name has to be identical or confusingly similar to the complainant's trademark. Um, the registrant has no legitimate interest in the name, and they registered it in bad faith. And the bad faith factor could be asking the – like if you approach Tom Cruise, hey, I registered TomCruise.com. Would you like to buy it from me? So that's one factor for your bad faith. So if you don't ask him for it, you have a better chance of not being sued by him, but then he can't get the name from you. So it's a weird – uh, it's a weird system. So let's go on. By the way, the whole course will not be about the nitty-gritty of the IP law. Um, I'm trying to go through in these first two lectures about what IP law is so you have a good feel for the actual legal system. So we'll know how to analyze it, understand it, um, critique it, put it in its place, decide what parts are good, what parts are bad, um, et cetera. Because you'll find that a lot of people that comment on IP, especially the defenders of IP, often don't know what they're talking about. Um, and libertarians and laymen often confuse and um, uh, different types of IP rights. You know, they'll say, um, "Doesn't Coca-Cola have a patent on their name?" No, that's a trade secret. I'm sorry, that's a trademark. Um, you know, um, uh, Stephen King has a, uh, a patent on his book. No, that's copyright. You know. Or, or you know, um, some company has a copyright on their drugs. No, that's a patent. You know, they, they mix these things up all the time, and yet they're in favor of them. I and mean, obviously, they don't really know the differences and even understand how they work. So I think it's important to see how they work to lay open the guts of these systems and um, to really understand how they're a really clear um, example of an unlibertarian legislative bureaucracy, basically. Okay. There's also something related to domains, uh, the Anti-Cyber Squatting Consumer Protection Act. Uh, this is related to what I talked about before. This is a U.S. law, though. So it's it's basically um, a way of stopping cyber squatting. And of course, you know, this is partly uneconomic and partly based upon IP ideas because the IP aspect is that you can see from uh, the fact that there's a cause of action for registering or using or selling a name confusingly similar to a trademark of someone else. That's basically trademark concepts. But the fact that it's against squatting, and you'll know that a lot of uh, um, cities or states have laws against scalping, right, on tickets. Of course, there's nothing wrong with scalping because it just means you're you buy the ticket and you, you sell it to someone else. It's just arbitrage. I mean, it makes you only hurt people when you stop scalping and you, when you when you outlaw that that type of action, which is a type of squatting in a way. Okay. And again, 
I, there's a Madonna is an example I have here. I, I do have an example. Uh, Robert De Niro. Um, so Madonna used it, um, and she, so she was able to get Madonna.com and some other names turned over to her under the UDRP procedure that I mentioned earlier. Robert De Niro, the famous actor, he claimed ownership of domain names that had Tribeca in them. Um, that had any content on the website related to film festivals, because I guess he's got some ownership of Tribeca Film Festival. So he's got some dispute with the owner of Tribeca.net. I don't know how it turned out. Okay, now, now let's turn to history. It's 8.48, uh, my time. Before we go on um, about the history of the IP system, and primarily I'm going to talk about patent and copyright. Does anyone have any questions at this point about the actual types of IP and the legal systems themselves? Because I'd be happy to, uh, to pause here and to address any questions. So Matt asks, is DRM legal? Parentheses, you're not allowed to resell digital media that you've purchased. Um, Oh, you mean is it legal for the copyright holder who sells music to put DRM on it to prevent you from reselling digital media that you purchased? Um, well, I, well, let's just let's just clear the facts up here. So, digital media media usually means like a physical media, right? Like a CD. And I don't think they're like a CD is usually not covered by DRM, right? So, if you own a CD, which is old technology, I know, or an LP. Or a paperback book. Um, those things are um, uh, something physical that you purchase, and you can buy, and you can resell that under the first sale doctrine. Now, I do think some software is sold in that form, and you know is encoded or encrypted or disabled or something, unless you have a lock. Um, yeah. So basically, yeah. There's no. It's not illegal to ever put DRM on something if you want to. That's just like putting a lock on something. It's not illegal. Um, but the distinction here is, um, in the law, there's a distinction between a sale and a license. Okay, a license is more like a lease. So when you buy a CD, you are buying the physical object, but you only have a license, which is permission. To use the music on it for non-commercial purposes, but you can sell that physical medium under the first sale doctrine. But you couldn't make a copy of it and sell the copy because you you don't own the content. You don't own the the copyrighted material on there. You only have a license to do it. You don't have the ownership of it. When you download, um, let's say movies or songs. Or when you purchase software, even on a disk, I believe, usually the way the seller words it is that they're granting you a license. So even if you buy a song for 99 cents from Apple's iTunes store, you're not really buying a song. You're purchasing a license to that music. Even if it's not DRM, and they're not DRM anymore, you still don't have the right to give a copy to someone else or sell a copy to someone else because you only have a license to it. And because it's not a physical medium that the first sale doctrine would apply to, and anyway, the first sale doctrine applies to sales. So you don't technically – you didn't technically have a sale. You just had a license. So there's no first sale doctrine. So no, you cannot um, – um, well, it's a little fuzzy in the law right now. There's, there's a company that was just started. I forgot what it was called, and they're actually trying to come up with a model where if you have a um, – a digital song that you bought or a movie, you can resell it to someone else. But I think there's a system where you know you actually wipes it from your hard drive or something. Now, of course, there's no way to guarantee this, which just shows why all these property concepts, applying them to the to the realm of non-scarce things, makes almost no sense uh, because these things can be copied over and over. I mean, let's say I buy a CD. I believe in the U.S. you have the right to make a backup copy of that CD or to rip it. And to put the songs on your iPod, let's say. So that's legal, okay? But if you then sell the CD and you keep the copy you made on your iPod, are you infringing copyright? Well, the sale of the CD is not an infringement because the first sale doctrine. 
Now, the copy on your iPod was already there, so you didn't really copy it at a point in time when you didn't have the right to do it. So are you grandfathered in? I mean, no, I don't really know what the answer is. I don't think anyone knows. Uh, it's, it's cloudy because these laws really are incoherent and make no sense. Jock says you could use something like Bitcoin's mechanism to pass on the digital media and lose the ability to use it yourself. Well, yeah, that's the idea. Amazon has this already with the Kindle with this loaning your book for 14 days to, or two weeks or whatever to, to a friend. It disables it on your device, and then you get it back. And then this, this site I was talking about, this service, it was discussed recently on Squill, I think, this week in law. Um, or, or maybe this week in tech, one of the recent episodes. Anyway, there's a service that was trying to come up with a way to let you sell, resell your used, so-called used digital media. And I think it would have to find a way to disable it on your own computer, which is problematic. So, so the bottom line, DRM is legal. You can put DRM on anything as long as the person agrees to it. Uh, if it interferes with your ability to resell something, well – too bad. Okay. Any other questions before we go on to um, history? Oh yeah, Gwendolyn has quick. This is relevant to what we just talked about too. Yeah, I have a blog post on my C4SIF in the last couple of weeks about this topic. What she says is there's talk of putting a limit on how many times an ebook can be lent in public libraries to like 12 lendings. Uh, I thought it was more than that, but it's something like that, 20 or 30 or some a small number. And then it would expire, and they need to be repurchased from the library. Yeah, there is talk about that, which of course is ridiculous. I mean books – libraries buy books now, and they can loan them as many times as they want until the book falls apart. Well, digital media cannot fall apart, and this is what the sellers are saying. They're saying, well, it's unfair that these digital copies last forever. <laughs> so they're trying to penalize you. For the fact that it lasts um, forever. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, there is, there is talk about doing that. That's correct. And of course, the idea of lending an ebook makes no sense anyway. I mean, we're trying to apply these models applicable to the world of physical, scarce goods and material things and objects to the realm of things that can be copied forever and that last forever and they can be perfectly duplicated easily in one second. It makes no sense. Okay, so let's go on now to the history of IP. Now, there's something I sometimes call the immaculate conception of IP. By the way, it's 8.55, and in five or ten minutes, I'm going to take a, a five-minute break, and then we'll resume. We may, we may go to the end of the 90-minute period. On the history part, so I'm cover everything, so we don't get uh, farther behind. Uh, if we stay up on history, then we're we're good for the next lecture. Um, and I could stay a little bit later for questions if anybody would like. Okay. Now I, I call it the immaculate conception of IP based upon um, one of my favorite Rothbard articles um, called Robert Nozick and the Immaculate Conception of the State. Now what Rothbard does is he criticizes Nozick's uh, anarchy state and utopia. Which most people who haven't read it um, assume is a radical libertarian book defending anarchy, but of course it's not at all. <clears throat> it's a somewhat libertarian book, but it's um, um, anarchy, state, and utopia basically is an attempt to justify the state. It, it's an attempt to show how the state, at least a minimal state. So Mosaic was more of advocating anarchy here. Um, it was an attempt to show how the state could arise by a series of legitimate steps. Um, and therefore, the state is not inherently illegitimate. Now, of course, even if he was right, which he's not because there's mistakes in his argument, uh, the states we have didn't arise that way. They, none of them arose by the steps that Nozick outlined that would be a possible way for a legitimate state to arise, and that's what Rothbard critiques. So I'm going to uh, – Jock says he doesn't make any arguments, just assertions. Well, I think you're referring to his uh, – the beginning of his book where he talks about um, uh, he's going to just assume that we have rights. Right? Yeah, he doesn't. He never argues for rights. He just assumes. He takes it for granted that we have rights. I actually don't have a problem with that too much. Um, his problem is how he applies it. Anyway, these Rothbard quotes are good. 
Beginning with a free market anarchist state of nature, Nosy portrays the state as emerging by an invisible hand process that violates no one's rights, first as a dominant protective agency, then to an ultra-minimal state, and then finally to a minimal state. For every state where the facts are available um, – for every state where the facts are available originated by a process of violence, conquest, and exploitation, in short, in a manner which Nozick himself would have to admit violated individual rights. Now, I'll bring this up because there's a, there's a similar uh, romantic notion of the conventional account. I'm on slide 23 now um, of how IP arose. And so, you know, if you ask anyone who has some familiarity with it, they're typically in favor of it. But they would say, oh, you know, it's sort of this Saturday morning uh, school schoolhouse rock cartoon version, romanticized notion of the founding of America and how great civil government is and democratic government's wonderful and our government's the best in the world and we're here to protect rights and blah 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 and the founding fathers are wonderful quasi libertarians even though they owned slaves and conscripted people and taxed people and hoisted an illegal constitutional coup in the country, and um, you know, George Washington took his slaves' teeth out to make his own false teeth, and you know, all these heroes are really great. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so the, the conventional account is that um, – so the libertarian founding fathers uh, of the country um, recognized this important natural right, and so they put it in the Constitution. And that's why Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution grants Congress the power to promote the progress of the science and the useful arts uh, by giving to authors and inventors limited monopoly on their inventions and, um, and works. Now, just as a point of trivia, um, you might think that science is what patents are for promoting. And the useful arts is, for, is what copyright is for promoting because copyright is for the artistic area and promotes artistic works, creative works, original works. And patents protect um, inventions that are usually scientific, scientific in nature, something like that. But that's actually not correct. Um, science, uh, back in the language of the um, late, late uh, 1700s, had to do with knowledge. So that actually had to do with general knowledge, including artistic knowledge. So that's what they were talking about. Cop copyright was for the promotion of science. Useful arts was like artists – think about artisans, practical you know, guys that made – I don't know, shoehorns shoe for horses and um, ironworks and craftsmen. Um, the useful arts are inventions. Now, so basically understand this. Uh, Patent and copyright are constitutional in my view because um, there's, a, there's a clause in the Constitution granting Congress the authority to do it. So the problem with copyright and patent is not that they're not constitutional. They are constitutional, although you could argue that they actually do not promote the progress of science and the useful arts because they actually harm that. And so it, uh, the laws that we have are contrary to the purpose granted for that power. Um, but I think that's a weak argument because the power is still there. Uh, the purpose is merely explanatory, or what we say in law is precatory, merely precatory. I don't think it's a limiting clause. Some argue that. Um, Jock says, we have the Royal Society for the Promotion of Science, Arts, and Manufactures, and Ben Franklin was an early member. Interesting, very interesting. <coughs> I have a blog I've put up. Post on the C4 essay I have recently in the last few weeks about Jefferson, how Jefferson came up with some um, new technique that he thought would, would be really useful, and he, he wanted to make sure it worked, and when it worked, he was going to publish an article about it anonymously to, to prevent anyone else from filing a patent on it, and then he was just going to let it become part of the public domain and let everyone use it. He was actually trying to prevent people from publishing it. If I recall, Franklin was also um, – didn't believe in patents and didn't patent his inventions, but I can't remember if that's correct. Okay, but back to the um, the origin of these statutes. In the U.S., trademarks have traditionally been protected by state law, but this act called the Lanham Act, I think in the 50s, L-A-N-H-A-M Act, um, was enacted a federal law which gives federal protection to trademarks 
that pertain to services and sales and products that pass through interstate commerce. Okay, so if you have something that's sold only within a state, it wouldn't be protectable by federal trademark, but by state trademark. And so that's based upon the IC clause or the interstate commerce clause, which of course is nonsense. The interstate commerce clause was not meant to give the federal government the power to regulate anything that had an effect on interstate commerce. <coughs> it was meant to um, basically establish a free market in, interst in, in, in um, inter interstate free market in the U.S., which we could have done that too, which is one reason – think why uh, the U.S. Uh, was so prosperous early on. Now, trade secret law is still mostly based on, on state law. So you have uh, patent and copyright are federal law in the U.S. Trademark is federal and state, although the federal part is unconstitutional, I believe. Trade secret is primarily state law. So uh, you have uh, it being called a natural right, but you also have it being uh, – Touted on utilitarian grounds, so people will always say, "Well, we, we need patent and copyright to encourage innovation or to incentivize innovation." And they're always talking about finding the right balance, right, between um, how long the term of patent and copyright should be, etc. Um, but as we'll see later, um, John Locke and even the founders, none of them ever regarded uh, patent and copyright as a natural rights. Um, they, re they viewed it just as a policy tool, that is, a sort of in a utilitarian way. They sort of had this hunch, I call it, call it. You know, they, they thought, well, if we grant these temporary monopolies, um, it will it'll give an incentive to these guys to invent a lot more things, and everyone will be better off. Um, that was their hunch. Now, they had no way of proving it, but that was their hunch. But the truth is the origins of these things… Were in monopoly and censorship. There's a great quote by Nietzsche from Book One of Dawn, and I, I learned this from Stephen Molyneux, by the way. I never heard this quote before until I heard it um, a few weeks ago, and I like it. And it's on rationality ex post facto. The quote is, um, and I'll, I'll take a break after this quote. Whatever lives long is is gradually so saturated with reason that it, its irrational origins become improbable. Does not almost every accurate history of, of the origin of something sound paradoxical and sacrilegious to our feelings? Doesn't the good historian contradict all the time? And I agree with that, and that's what I'm going to try to go into the, uh, the actual history and the origins of IP to show you to reveal um, its sordid origins and um, um, to try to uh, burst some of these rosy… Myths about um, the real purpose of patent and copyright law. So let's take a five minute break. It's five past the hour. We'll resume at 10 past the hour.
Okay. I'm back. Um, Aaron, Eric said, you're having a hard time hearing me. I'm sorry. I uh, have no ability to – I have a little volume control, but it's maxed out, and um, it's not letting me – I'm not sure actually which microphone is being, so I'll just get closer to it. Um, I'm not even sure if it's this microphone or the laptop's microphone. I have, I have my nice snowball, which I've been trying to use, but I don't know if it's using the snowball. Okay. Anyone, anyone here that's not ready to continue? Okay, let's continue. <clears throat> um, I'm going to kind of go quickly through this because a lot of the details are not that important, but um, uh, it's important to just kind of have a feel for where these things came from. I mean, you'll see the, the messy guts of it. You know, they always say that you never want to see how sausage or legislation is made, and um, I think that's true sometimes with the history of some of these practices that we're used to and we take for granted now. Um, Jock, by the way, you said this the video is freezing. I'm not, it hasn't happened in my end at all, unlike in the Dim Dim session from the last class I gave that you were a participant in. Is the technical quality here as good, better, worse? How would you compare it to the – okay, good. You say it's better. All right, fine. So I have here a, a little snapshot of a – I think that's a patent. So what a patent is, the word patent is used um, – the word patent is used because um, it means it means open, patente. Uh, so it means an open letter instead of a private letter. So like a monarch will give an open letter, which is like a public proclamation that this guy has the authority to do the following. You know, This guy has the authority to… Explore the new world in my name and homestead land in in Virginia or whatever. Um, this guy has the authority to um, capture Spanish ships and plunder them and kill people and keep 25 percent of the spoils and bring me the rest. That's Sir Francis Drake. Um, this guy has the right to make shoes in this town, and no one else does. You know. So basically patents were uh, monopoly grants or authorizations from the crown. And you know I'm not clear why they call some shoes patent leather shoes. I don't know if it's got anything to do with that at all. I need to find that out. Um, so <clears throat> this was done… A long time in the past. It was done back in Italy, um, but one of the kind of the modern origins of it, or the quasi-modern origins, um, what happened was you have the crown, <clears throat> the king, the monarch, granting the abusing these privileges, right? They were granting all these um, monopolies to their favorites, you know, to get um, loyalty from these people, to reward people without having to use tax money, etc. And Parliament passed the Statute of Monopolies. Now they called these things monopolies back then. They didn't they didn't mince words. Um, and in the Statute of Monopolies, they did that to restrict the abuses the king was or the monarch was doing. They took the power away from the king, and they gave it to Parliament, and they reduced the power to do this, and they stret they set criteria for it. Okay. So basically they took an indefinite and broad monopoly, and they replaced it with a more definite and restrictive one. So it was actually a restriction on the right to grant monopolies, and they carved out an exception for useful inventions. So they basically limited it, but they kept that one invention. They kept that one type of patent. Now at the time, um, no one called these things intellectual property. No one thought of them as property. They knew it wasn't property. They knew these were monopoly grants by the crown. 
Um, this is just a later propaganda ploy to try to justify these things in the face of criticism of these types of state grants of monopoly. Um, and as uh, Fritz Macklup, who's a famous Austrian economist um, who wrote um, several important studies in the 50s, as he, as he wrote, those who started using the word property in connection with inventions had a very definite purpose in mind. They wanted to substitute a word with a respectable connotation, property, for a word that had an unpleasant privilege, unpleasant ring privilege. So it was, it was you know, it's propaganda. It's using different words. And I mentioned earlier that Francis Drake, he was given a letter patent in 1587 that allowed him to engage in piracy. Now, if you think about it, it's ironic that modern day Opponents of IP or scoff laws of IP, right? People who skirt IP law, uh, you know, people who download movies and share files, were called pirates, or they're called pirates. Let's say we don't want to be in trouble. Um, they're called pirates, right? But real pirates, you know, kill people and break things. Um, and the actual early use of patents, which is the his the origin of our modern patent system, was actually used to authorize actual pirates. So it's ironic that IP proponents accuse IP opponents of being pirates when they are the ones who are more associated with real piracy. So that's kind of an interesting and ironic uh, historical fact. Um, and here's another funny thing. You'll notice nowadays, like I said, that you have the statute of monopolies. Um, they use truth in advertising back then, um, but uh, uh, nowadays… Uh, so you have libertarians and others who are in favor of IP. If you call it a monopoly, they get indignant. Okay, it's not a monopoly. It's a property right. It's not a monopoly. Um, um, so you'll find that you know nowadays our statists are much less honest. Like I said, um, uh, they will call it a property right instead of a monopoly. And if you think about the Department of War, I think someone might have mentioned this earlier. Um, oh no, that was in the email I had today about a blog post I did on Lou Rockwell. Um, in the U.S., we had a Department of War. It was called Department of War, good, honest name. That's what it was for. That's what the military is for, to go to war, um, until 1947, uh, and then, the then it was called the Department of the Army of the new military establishment, and then a couple of years later, they changed it to the Department of Defense, which is called now. So that sounds a lot more, um, a lot more peaceful, right? Um, but it is widely recognized that patents are state-granted monopolies even by some advocates of the system and by opponents, of course. I mean Richard Epstein, um, who's a proponent of IP law, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean these things are recognized to be monopolies. The United States Supreme Court, they routinely recognize the historic tension between patent law and antitrust law because antitrust law is meant to stop monopoly power. But patent law is granted by the government and gives you monopoly power, so there's what they call a tension. Okay, So this, the courts are always saying, well, there's a tension between patent law and antitrust law. So they give you these monopolies, but you're not supposed to abuse them, whatever that means. And in fact, as I mentioned, the first patent statute, the modern one, was the statute of monopolies. Okay, So clearly the purpose of IP is to provide a monopoly to a creator or an inventor or an innovator. To give them an incentive to disclose the idea or to come up with it in the first place. Now, copyright, the origin of copyright is in literal censorship, and in fact, they're still used for censorship. And I'll get to some examples in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so, you have the printing press, and I think 1400s, the Gutenberg printing press started becoming uh, um, more popular and started threatening the control that the church and the state had over the spread of knowledge. Before that, they controlled these guilds of scribes, guys that hand copied uh, books, right? So um, what happened was you know, the court had a, a list of prohibited books, and then this, this company called the Stationers Company in 1557 – I think the Stationers Company was formed in the 1400s um, – had to do with printing books using this, the newfangled printing press. Right. Well, the, the the church gave them a monopoly over what books could be approved to be printed. Um, so basically, copyright arose out of this because 
um, and it, oh, as, as a as a who's B and L, uh, Boulder and Levine in against intellectual monopoly. Is they you know Galileo's trial was an exercise in copyright enforcement by the Pope of Rome because they wanted to prevent him from publishing his book. Okay. So the roots of copyright are literally in censorship. Now, what happened was the Statute of Anne was passed. It's called the Statute of Anne of 1709. I think it was passed in, in 1710. It granted 14-year copyright terms. <clears throat> but what it, they were trying to um, uh, – what happened was the stationers – the stationer – stationer's company, what do you call it? Yeah, so the stationer's company's charter expired, and then the publishers had gotten used to this monopoly uh, privilege, and they asked Parliament to pass a new statute. Parliament said, well, we think we'll give it to the authors instead, so they, that's what the Statute of Anne did. So that's where copyright came from, and here's one important thing to, to recognize. One reason the um, authors were in favor of this at the time – think about it. Up until that time… To have your book published or copied, the government had to approve it. So basically you went through a government censorship system. Um, so by transferring this copyright from the stationer's company or the publishers to the author, now they had the control of copying their books. So the, the, the original motivation or the reason that authors like this was it kind of liberated their own works from the control of the state. But now it's looked at as a monopoly right that you hold that you can stop people from copying your works. So the original goal or the original motivation was to permit your work to be copied more um, instead of having the state prevent it. Uh, it's a good quote here. I'm going to skip this quote. You can read this later. Basically, it's a summary of what I've been saying on slide 31, so I want to try to get through the remaining – I think I have 40 slides. I think we can do it in the next 10 minutes. Now. Um, I might have some of these out of order. I'm going to skip this because I think we cover this next time. So we have less slides than I thought. This is good. Oh, yeah, here's some more interesting history. So it, it's, it's, uh, even before 1624, the early history of state patents, back in 500 BC, there was a Greek city of Sybaris, which is now in southern Italy. They had these annual culinary competitions, um, which gave the winner the exclusive right to prepare his dish for one year. So can you imagine um, you know, the arguments we have now about uh, – I mean the, right now there's no copyright in food. In restaurant dishes. Maybe, maybe someone's going to dredge this up again, right? But you can see this idea has been around a long time, um, granting these monopolies. And you know, as I mentioned, the way these things started, kings were granting these back in the 14th century. The first general patent law was actually in Venice in 1474. Um, it was used in the 16th century by German princes, and um, uh, it sometimes – actually, the good thing about these – Remember, we had all these guilds, so sometimes these patents were granted to give you the right to make something that the, the guild otherwise had the monopoly over. So in a way, patents were used sometimes to reduce uh, monopoly positions and increase competition because of the existing guild system. Um, so sometimes patents are credited with liberating industries from restrictive regulations uh, by the guild and the local authorities. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, it's similar to the initial purpose or use of copyright law to counter the censorship of the author's own works. So these things had sort of good um, – some good aspects originally. By the way, this is an interesting fact, uh, which in a way shows the arbitrariness. Right now the patent term is about 17 years. It's 20 years from the date of filing, but it takes about two or three years to prosecute the patent. And so when it issues, you, you've lost about two or three years of that 20-year term, so you have about 17 years left. Copyrights now last, I don't know, I think 70 years past the death of the author, so well over 100 years in many cases. Uh, originally, um, patents were 14 years, and I think copyrights were similar. Um, the reason that it was 14 years was because that was 
the term of two consecutive seven-year apprenticeships. Now, remember the apprenticeship system was really uh, more prevalent back in um, um, in those days. As Mackelup in a 1958 study noted, the duration of patents was determined by historical precedent and compromise, political compromise. Um, it was based upon the idea that two sets of apprentices should, in seven years each, be trained in the new techniques that the you know, the master came up with, and uh, through a prolong prolo through a prolongation by another seven years, uh, though a prolongation by seven years was allowed in some cases. So the idea was that we're going to give you a monopoly over your new idea um, for time to for you to train some apprentices. Otherwise, they might be competing with you, or others will be competing. So basically, this 14-year time, and if you add seven years to it, that's 21 years, which is close to the current term of patent. Um, it's based upon the time of apprenticeships, which is completely arbitrary. It has nothing whatsoever to do with today's economy or with uh, natural rights. Um, I mentioned some of this already, um, but uh, there were uh, these these patents were granted to court favorites for revenue purposes, and there were abuses. They were unpopular, um, and what happened was. In 1603, in the case of monopolies, a court declared a monopoly in playing cards, cards void under the common law. Okay, uh, and so then, as I mentioned, 1623-24, the statute of monopolies was passed by the crown to to scale back this practice of monopolies, but they made an exception for inventions. And by the way, sometimes some of you have probably heard of the Magna Carta. Which is one of the sort of founding documents is the origin of natural rights theory or the American rights system based on English rights, the Magna Carta or the, or the Great Charter. Um, so the statute of monopolies is sometimes referred to as the Magna Carta of the rights of inventors. Um, a little bit more on the history of this. In the, in the, in the 1620 to 1850 was the spread of the patent system. Because 1624 was when the statute of monopolies was finally enacted, it became the basis of the British patent law, which became the model for patent laws in other places. Um, interestingly, the first – what's called general patent law, um, which was uh, was South Carolina in 1691. So you have sort of you – have, you, have, um, you have the Italian system. You have the English system in 1623. But the first really modern patent law was 1691 in South Carolina, uh, and then finally the first really modern one was the American one in 1790, um, which is a system we have still in place now, although it's been modified since then. So basically you have um, uh, 1624 to 1850 spread of all these patent ideas, all based upon the grant of monopolies early on. Um, now. This is my favorite period, 1850 to 1873. There was a vigorous uh, opposition to patents. People started waking up and saying, what the hell have we done? You know, These are government grants of monopoly. It's a horrible idea. There was a lot of arguments similar to the ones we have now that are starting again now. Um, a lot of pressure uh, – well, there's pressure to expand them. Engineers and inventors wanted them because they're pressure groups. right? They're, they're special interest groups. But the free trade groups were opposed to patent monopolies, so there's lots of commissions and studies and calls for, for abolition. And the, Sw the Swiss legislature refused to enact patent law several times, 1849, 1851, 1854, and twice in 1863. And here's a quote here. The economists of the greatest competence said that the patent system was pernicious and indefensible. But it was a losing battle. You can see that it was inevitable. Everyone was finally going to adopt it, sort of like Obamacare and the minimum wage. You know, even though economists all know that the minimum wage is a bad idea and causes unemployment, you still have it because it's politically popular and hard to get rid of. And we had socialized medicine uh, spreading, I don't know, 50, 60, 70 years ago in Europe and South America, and finally, finally. Spreading to the U.S., we're about to get it with Obamacare. I mean, we held out for a long time, but these things have an inevitability about them, which is depressing. Now, interestingly, in 1869, the Netherlands repealed their patent law. They had enough of it. They said, "You just can't make a good patent law. This stuff is it's ridiculous." 
Um, but finally, the patent advocates had a victory. Now, here's one interesting fact about it, which most patent advocates don't know or don't care about it. Um, <clears throat> so in the – up until this late 1800s period, patents were largely seen as um, uh, anti-free market. Okay, So the free traders would attack patents and tariffs together as things that were – you know, invasive of a free market or free trade system. But you had this big depression in 1873 in Europe, a panic of 1873, and what that did was that led to the rise of protectionism and nationalism. So you had reduced opposition to tariffs and protectionism and into patents because they all were go they all went together. So what happened was because everyone started uh, becoming more or less resistant to people's calls for protectionism and nationalism. We have to protect the, you know, the our national economy because of this horrible recession we we're having, this depression we're having, right? So free trade rhetoric basically become uh, became unpopular because of the um, the depression. So in a way, you could say that um, this recession is one of the main causes of the. Of the uh, victory of the patent advocates and the loss, um, the reason that the anti-patent movement, which I have on page 39, lost steam. They lost steam because of a depression, right, which gave rise to re uh, pr protection of sentiments. So it opened the door to an increase in patent propaganda by interest groups, and then so finally, 1887, even Switzerland gave in. Um, <clears throat> now, although they had some limitations on their initial patent law. They, they, they had a mechanical model limitation. To have a patent, you had to give a mechanical model, which most, most other countries didn't require. Um, they even removed that in 1907 because Germany um, uh, threatened them with tariffs. Uh, they said, look, you guys get rid of this mechanical model limitation. So it's similar to what the U.S. does now uh, in twisting the arms of China and India um, and other developing economies to adopt a Western… American-style patent and copyright system, primarily for the benefit of Western um, copyright and invention-related interests like the big pharmaceutical or electronics companies, uh, Apple, Intel, Microsoft all rely on copyright and patent, um, and also Hollywood and the, the music industry. Right. So basically, you know, at the behest of these corporatist lobbying groups, the Western nations are twisting the arms. Of uh, China and the developing countries to adopt our IP system, even though it's going to stifle their economy, hurt their innovation, cost them money, increase the price of drugs, pharmaceuticals, uh, put people in jail for copying songs, bootlegging, etc. Uh, so you can see that this practice was common even back in the 1800s when, when um, or 1900s in Germany. Uh, twisted Switzerland's arm to give in to their idea of what the patent system should be like. So finally, the Netherlands, which was the last holdout, the last bastion for free trade and inventions, they reintroduced the patent system in 1910, uh, effective in 1912. Let's see. Yeah, I have some duplicate slides here. Uh, so let's just let's we'll stop here. Let me just say what we'll talk about next class. We're, we're going we're gonna to now talk about um, the, the different justifications for IP and give an overview of sort of the Austrian libertarian approach of how to view uh, property scarcity and ideas. So we have a way of analyzing these empirical and utilitarian and um, natural rights type arguments um, for IP. So we've gone five – well, not five minutes over because we started five minutes late, so I'm happy I stopped on time. Sorry I didn't leave time for questions in the official period, but I wanted to get all this in, and I'm happy to stay longer and take any questions now for as long as anyone wants to stay. So shoot. Any questions? Everybody want to go home? Jock, I know it's 2 in the morning or something for you, 2.30.
I am reading a, a, a reading something Jock clips here about William Shipley. He wanted to use public subscriptions to make awards to inventors in the arts and commerce. So he founded a Royal Society to encourage it, which had competitions. That's interesting. I didn't know about that. Um, uh, and that's perfectly fine. That's more like the um, the Nobel Prize Award, right, or the MacArthur Prize or private prize. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having private – I'm assuming this was private, right, Royal Society. I, I don't assume this was funded by tax dollars. The ones I talked about earlier – and this is probably not $80 billion or the, or the – the, uh, the inflation adjusted equivalent of $80 billion, which was suggested by uh, $30 billion or $80 billion was suggested by uh, even like some libertarians and, and, and Stiglitz, uh, and that was just for medical innovation. Um, you know, So they said we should have $80 billion of tax dollars set aside for annual rewards to people who come up with really cool you – know, you know, useful innovations in the medical area. Well, I mean, where, where are you going to stop? I then guess I then guess we need maybe a trillion dollars in there in the pot for other types of inventions and for copy, you know, for, for artistic works and new painters and new artists, which of course we have already in smaller forms with the uh, um, what is it, National Foundation for the Arts or whatever they call it. Anyway, um, that's interesting, Jock. Thanks for the information. I'm, I'm going to look into that. Any other comments, questions from anyone? Okay, Donald. I understand it's it's been an hour and a half, and that's a long class, so um I think we should call it a call it a, a break, and I'm happy to have a, a an office hour sometime if we think we have a need for it. Why don't we see how this goes? If anyone has any questions they want to post in the uh, course um, and, uh, materials page, I, I can answer them either next time or in writing. So I enjoyed the class. Thank you everybody for your attention, and everybody have a good night. And I'll see you next uh, Tuesday. Good night everybody. <laughs>